So today is June 18, 2017, and what I um, came across is a very interesting uh, recording that talks about <clears throat> the practice of retaliation at um, police uh, uh, forces, uh, enforcement agencies across the country. And um, WikiLeaks just republished this, so it was out on SoundCloud for a while, but now uh, WikiLeaks has uh, authenticated it and uh, republished it for everybody to hear. So in it, you're going to hear two um, former police officers of more than 20 years or so. One, I think, has 26 years experience as a police officer. And what they do is they describe the, um, the, the, the <clears throat> tools by which enforcement agents, uh, agencies use retaliation to get rid of people who expose corruption <clears throat> and the the one this the tool of choice is and always has been to uh, pile up a, um, a pile of fake or false or misleading um, uh, paperwork to say that this agent is bad or this officer is bad and they just build up this uh, pile of fake paper and then at the end of the day they fire the employee based on that uh, pile of fake paper. But listen to the recording and listen to the way these officers uh, explain. It's, it, it seems like, well, how do they get away with it? But listen to the recording and you'll, you'll, you'll come to understand that it's, um, it's very subtle and then it becomes uh, very intensified. And they explain the motive, which is uh, the motive for supervisory uh, uh, officers and agents to retaliate against people whether they know what the reason they're retaliating for or not but their incentive is promotion to promote up the ranks so if they please the uh, uh, officer or agent or whoever it is that promotes them if they please that person by attacking you then they uh, in effect will um, will stand a better chance of getting a promotion. One of them wanted to be the security guy. He claimed he was a security guy. Welcome. Brian, turn that down. Fade, fade, fade. Welcome to a internal affairs investigation on Security Guy Ready with Chuck, Hollywood Herald, and Ray... Melonhead Schneiders. That's the name. I will explain shortly. Mr. Brian, Mr. Bristow is out again. Paul No Show Bristow. Well, I have to come up with another name for him. Paul, I'm just now, Paul's be, his duties have been uh, been taken up. Uh, somebody set fire to a facility. Uh, Paul's a hardworking within person. his uh, jurisdiction. He has to go handle that. So that's an important thing. Paul's a hardworking guy. He is a hardworking guy. So today we're going to talk about internal affairs and police. We finished up our show with uh, Rod Bernson a few weeks ago about uh, police optics. Remember that? That was a good show, Brian. And uh, today I have a really special guest, very special actually. Uh, it's Mr. Ray Schneiders. Uh, are we supposed to say your name, by the way? I can't remember. I forgot oh. to ask you if you're supposed to say your name or not. Absolutely. Okay, no, we're not. We're not being in a code uh, code five uh, Charlie or anything. Okay, not at all. <laughs> Ray's a, a special friend because I've known Ray for 30, 32 years or something like yeah, that. Yeah, thirty going on thirty three. Thirty three. Went to class sixty one at Rio Hondo. We both graduated from Rio Hondo, and we both went to uh, San Gabriel PD. And then for San Gabriel PD, we went our different PDs and departments. And uh, Ray stayed in a lot longer than I did. Uh, police work got tired of me, I think is a good way to describe How it. How could so, it anybody or any entity be tired well, of Well, you know, you know the issues I had with my big mouth. <laughs> it didn't always serve me well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, like I'm not far behind you there. But that was my nickname at the academy was Chuck Chuck Hollywood Herald, and, and yours was... Uh, uh, was Melonhead. Because, melonhead. Because you have a giant head. And there is no sign of that <laughs> insignia ever, <laughs> no. ever stopping. <laughs> but that's because you have a giant brain. You're very smart. People with large heads are smart. So you know, my is... wife my wife said that. God bless her. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's not what everyone else says. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just we're only half kidding. We want to talk about a serious subject today because of all the stuff going on in the police departments. It's just wacky. It is. All the views that people have. And <clears throat> I just want... This show is – Ray and I are just going to kind of talk about things you guys don't know about in police work, basically. Stuff that yes. goes on, you know, things that go on in IAs, things that go on inside police departments to police themselves, so to speak, right? Correct. So the first thing I just want to kind of throw out there to you is um, 
What do you think is going on with all the negative police press right now? What is what is our what is our problem with that as police officers? What what did we do to contribute to that? I got some ideas. What do you think? Well, there's not so much what we contributed to, but you know, there's so many um, so many different entities, various news entities. You know, it used to be you could watch the news, and much like the way we were taught to write police reports, it would be the who, what, when, where, how, and why of a crime. And when reporters are investigating, uh, they're investigative reporters or even just field reporters, they're supposed to satisfy those requirements too because those are the minimum standards yeah, a, viewer, a viewer would want. The facts. And even if you couldn't get all of those, uh, you would at least mention you attempted to and couldn't. Or if you get them, oh, that's maybe a very I'll good point. That's right. Future. Your story would say Chuck was unavailable for comment or something. You'd know what you couldn't do, right? Right. Good so point. you wouldn't be leaving that story with more questions than answers, right? And that's not what that's not as not what's happening. That's and, a good point that you made. That there used to be really, you know, back in the day, we had three or four stations, big news stations when we were cops. Yes. And now there's so many of them. Everybody has a different view and a different opinion, and everybody wants to compete with each other. Yes. To get a more salacious soundbite, I think. That's yes. part of the problem, too. It's more competitive, and the questions simply aren't being asked. For instance, if you were to ask uh, a lot of the political pundits or the organizers of, for instance, a lot of these protests, um, they won't ask them this basic question. That is, if you don't agree with this shooting that took place in Ferguson or someplace else, Give me a scenario in which a white male police officer would be justified in shooting a black male. And you'll have that dead silence there. Because a lot of times these people, if you were to push them, which they don't do in their interviews, you would come to find out that this is an ideology and an agenda that is anti-law enforcement. And they're not going to give you a scenario in which a police officer, a white male police officer, can shoot a black male under any circumstance, even in the defense of their own life. Now, do you think it's anti-law enforcement, or is it just that what they need to do to make something uh, popular and get ratings is they have to, you know, do what you're saying. They have to come up with the things that are controversial, that are, you know, topical and sound bites. You know, I mean, that's one way to look at it, too. In other words, trying to get ratings, you're not going to get a rating by putting on a story about a policeman takes a kitty cat out of the tree. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to watch the story. Right? That's that's true. Unfortunately, I mean, you know, it's kind of what it is. But do you think there's really a, a police bias? There is a bias in, in the press in that, for instance, if you look at um, whistleblowers in law enforcement, which we, which we can talk about, right. the retaliation that takes place with that. Um, and a good example would be in the Christopher Dorner case. When... Police officers come forward and let's say they expose corruption. If you can go back to the to Serpico in New York City, um, there is retaliation against that individual for doing that. Not only retaliation, but it's amazing to me how the public fails to get behind police officers who, let's say, engage in whistleblowing, who expose corruption. And these same citizens who are absolutely hell-bent on wanting officers to live up to this you know perfect standard and always being honest will suddenly turn into Tony Soprano and call the guy a rat and say well what did he expect was gonna happen he read it out on his buddies and it's this two-faced reaction from the public actually that I blame for making it worse no well, that's that is a good point um, I've worked at I worked at three agencies as you know and you did uh, you don't have to mention trade agencies if you don't want to but you, you've been oh, yes, I, went, I started with San Gabriel PD with you, and uh, not long after you left, uh, I went to Fontana PD. That's where you retired from? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you, 30 years, right? Almost you did. Well, no, actually 26. 26. Okay. That's close. All right. Yeah. So you know what you're talking about. And all the policemen we've worked with, I, I, don't, I don't think I know any that really would believe that if you brought up corruption inside a police department, they'd come after you. The only people that come after you are the ones that are corrupt. That's what's interesting, though, because right? I mean, well, I don't look, want a dirty cop working with me. I just don't. No, flat out dirty cop. No, we don't want to stand next to you and work with you because that jeopardizes my family, and my job. But if you're if you are part of that ring of the dirty guys or the inappropriate guys, and you're going to get put. I mean, that happened to me in UCLA. I blew the whistle on these guys. You know, the 
the department was, you know, selling police cars out the back door with no VIN numbers to, uh, you know, Tijuana PD and things like that. And, they, you know, the cops didn't come after me. It's the administration that did. Absolutely. Right? Because it, it's interesting. And this goes to citizen complaints, too. Um, for instance, if uh, one of your listeners is driving today and they're pulled over and they feel that the contact that they had with the officer was so negative that they felt that it rose to the level of having to file a formal citizen complaint against them. What they don't realize during that process is what happens with that internal affairs investigation has more to do with that officer standing with the police administration than anything to do with your complaint. It That, that I know is 100% true. <laughs> in fact, well, remember back in the day, uh, I can't, we're not going to mention any names, all right, but uh, certain administrators uh, used to go out and solicit complaints just yes. to package your file. I mean, this stuff goes on all the time in police departments by administrators. In fact, I got a guest coming on in a couple of weeks that wrote a book called uh, Blue, what was it? I, I forgot the name. I beg your pardon. But anyway, it's about, he's an, he was a cop for many years and wrote a book about police administrators and how basically there's five or six types and they're all Adam Henry's basically. And you almost it seems like you don't get promoted unless you are the sort of personality in the police department, right? Because well, they want to get you off the street because you're already no good on the street and they put you up in administration. Then you go after cops. Well, here's a question for you and for your listeners because your listeners can answer this just as well as you or I could. Have you ever found a high-ranking member of law enforcement, lieutenant, captain, deputy chief, commander, chief of police, and regardless of what time you, amount of time you've spent with them or seen them on TV, have you ever looked at some of these guys and wondered how on earth did this individual ever get promoted? Well, it's a good question. I, we're not going to paint with a broad brush here. No. Or a blue brush because we're, they're still brothers and things like that. But there is there is a great degree of truth to what you're saying, that that if you walk in the door and you say, I want to complain about that officer, uh, your facts will be taken. But a lot of times your facts are turned into something that aren't exactly facts. They're turned into opinions inside and inside a police department and investigation. There is no place for that. There's, these are facts, not opinions. Right. And uh, this contributes to the internal angst within police departments and police officers where they are unfairly put upon internally. I don't think cops have the big, biggest, as big a complaint about the citizens as they do about the things that go on inside, right? Yes. I mean, you probably experience the same thing. I've had more knives stuck in my back inside the police station than outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting place. And that's that's what's interesting about, you know, going back to who gets promoted. Because one thing you'll know from an administrative standpoint, and I grew up with, you know, a father in law enforcement who made it through the rank up to captain, is that chiefs of police are notorious for not promoting anyone that's smarter than they are. Yeah, well, because it's be it's 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 not considered an asset; it's considered a threat. Right, and that's for instance when you can remember when maybe your chief of police would come to your police union meeting and just have a talk, and you know sometimes the chief would ask, "Hey, give me some suggestions. What can we do to improve the police department?" Well, all that is is a ruse to find out who they don't want to promote because the chief is thinking, "Look." If, if these guys had anything good to say, if if these guys had a good idea, I'd have thought of it first. All he's doing is he's identifying those that are going to be a problem if he were to promote them because all of a sudden they'll be getting challenged at staff meetings and, and things like that. They want somebody who is just going to, you know, tow the administrative. Okay, line. let's take the other side of that. Police departments are a para, paramilitary organization. You have to have command and control. You have to have people do what they're told. You can't have a bunch of uh, free thinkers out there uh, disobeying orders because that causes its own problem. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. Okay, so the balance is how do I get a guy that's going to follow directions and also be able to think on his feet to make proper decisions? Because all cops are independent decision makers. I mean, I, I'm not sure about the other laws in the other states, but in California, the chief of police has absolutely no more authority to arrest somebody than I do. Correct. They're cops. And the chief of police can't walk up to me and say, unarrest that guy. He can't do that. They think they can. They think they can do administrative paperwork and write me up for something that's a bad arrest. They can do that. But they can't tell me to arrest or not arrest somebody. You just can't do that either. So the trick is, if I have a bunch of sycophants uh, around me, uh, that's not good in one way because then they can't do anything unless I tell them to do something, right, because they're yes men. But if I'm, uh, you know, a rebel with a cause, then I got dissension and 
chaotic police department. It's a it's a balance, and I'm not sure how you achieve that, but right. And I think in in the scenario that I gave, where you know a chief would maybe try to identify somebody who would be challenging challenging them, I think they're looking to to the fact that look, if this person is the rank of officer, and they're already telling me how they could do a better job than I am. Imagine if I promoted this person and gave them more power and more responsibility. Imagine the earful I would get from him at that time. And it's not that he's going to, you know, promote somebody that's just completely inept, but they're going to get somebody that is just basically going to be a yes man. No, that's probably not far from true. I mean, I, I was a VP at a couple of companies, and my philosophy was I want to hire people smarter than me because I don't know anything. And uh, that makes that makes your job easier in a way. And you have a better run organization. Now, if anybody wanted my job, you are glad to take my job as a vice president. <laughs> Work in the Academy Awards or some crappy assignment I had, right? It's just a terrible, thankless job in the guard business. But if I would get a challenge like that, the way I handled that was just open discussion. In other words, you got that great idea, throw it out there. You're not throwing it out in my office in a private conversation. Let's put it out there to the rank and file and see what happens. You don't want to do that in the police department. They won't do that because it looks like your authority is being eroded. But I hear what you say. I mean, there is definitely this weird thing in police work where the, the people that get promoted, uh, I don't know. There's the guy at, uh, I forget what department it was I worked at. He got in the police car and remember how it says, don't push the shotgun trigger in the police car? Correct. Push the shotgun trigger and blew a hole in the ceiling of the police car and blew out the lights and then got promoted, you know? Right. And the guy that was doing quick draw in the locker room and dropped his gun and it went through the toilet and almost shot a guy's head that was sitting on the crapper. Remember that guy? Right. They, so, le they left the hole in that, too. They didn't they, even pass that They left that the hole. Out. The hole's still there to this day, right? So <laughs> Officer So-and-so was on the crapper and almost got his head blown off because somebody's playing quick. And that guy got promoted. Right. Right. And these people keep getting promoted because if they if they don't get them out of the field, they're going to, you know, hurt somebody. Again, not all commanders are like this. LAPD has some outstanding commanders. LAPD is kind of a more old school, right, where you came up based on your abilities and the tests were based on abilities and things like that in old days. And, uh, you know, we, there's some really good leaders in, in LAPD. Smaller departments, you know, there's more competition, right? So there's not as much of a chance to promote. And so it's a little more cutthroat in a lot of ways. That's correct. And speaking of LAPD, that's probably what uh, Christopher Dorner experienced. Because... Let's talk about that case. So ref 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 uh, refresh our memories for our, our listeners who may not know about that. Well, uh, Christopher Dorner was an officer on LAPD. Uh, he was also a um, military reservist. Um, and... He was a full-time officer, correct? Full-time officer right. and had actually engaged in whistleblowing. Uh, there was actually, I believe it was a black female supervisor that he felt uh, conducted, did something inappropriate, I think with an arrest or something. Now, I bet you a lot of people don't know that, that he blew the whistle on uh, a fellow officer. Correct. As an active PD. Okay. And all of a sudden, you know, reports of his aren't any good anymore and he's being... Uh, reprimanded for this, that, and the other. And I think in his mind, um, when he was terminated from, from LAPD, probably the default setting in his mind, and probably rightfully so from his perspective and life experience, is that he was fired because he was black. And what he probably never realized up until the time he died was that he could actually be... Uh, hated more for being a whistleblower than for being black because that's why he was fired. He was most likely hired more for being black. He was fired because he was a whistleblower. And the, this type of um, punitive action by administrators on to Christopher Dorner, it was a small message to Christopher Dorner, very personal to him, but the larger one was to the rest of the department because if you know of corruption, if you know of wrongdoing, Keep your mouth shut or we're going to fire you, too. Now, how long? How many years was he on? I think it was less than five years. Okay, so if you I get to five years, incorrect. the department figures you're competent. Because you'll be gone in the first year and a half if you're not competent, per se, or passing probation. Some guys have trouble. If you stay five years, you're probably on your way to 20. Right. Right. So and you don't think it was because of any performance issue. It's directly because of that. Um, yes, because that's when you start having problems after the whistleblowing takes place. Yeah, and that that's when this paper trail correlation. and yeah. documentation and, the, you know, they try to create a progressive discipline thing where we've, you know, we've, he's got this problem and we're not going to be able to correct it. Um, yeah, that's. Now, what's interesting about that case is I know a couple of guys that worked internal affairs at LAPD. And, and this is just all, you know, 
shooting the crap here. We're not, uh, this isn't a, necessarily offered for a fact, but offered as kind of a example. And these guys used to tell me that, um, you know, every day there's a, a cop at LAPD that gets fired and or put in jail, literally, right? Because they're doing something that's inappropriate and against the law and it's screwed up. Then you hear about Rampart because that leaks out because it's a big caper. But they said that stuff's not unusual and we don't go around broadcasting it for a couple of reasons. One, you got to protect the confidentiality of an employee's records and police officer's records are even more confidential and so on. And what purpose does it serve to, you know, air your dirty laundry and so on? And I said, I always thought maybe they should say, hey, here's a, a website that says today this guy was let go. Here's what happened to him. Public humiliation and disgrace. And I, I know why they don't do it, but there's a, there's a lot of internal policing in most police departments where if you're really a bad guy and you're dirty, they don't want you around. But same token, if you're a whistleblower, they consider that a bad guy and you're you're not around very much longer, which is why I do a radio show. Oh, <laughs> one reason. Absolutely. That's why this kind of conversation you're not going to you're not going to hear on, you know, some other type of terrestrial radio because the press does not want to put out information like this because they count on this animosity, continued animosity taking place between uh, the public and the police. And without that, they can't, uh, you know, hype up stories and get ratings and in the competitive businesses, you said it is. So did you do internal affairs? Did it, no, I did not. Uh, no, I worked robbery, homicide, domestic violence, um, gangs. So in your experience at, at your departments, do you think internal affairs were handled properly? Uh, the dispositions are what are not handled properly, primarily. So you think they get to a conclusion properly with the facts, but then what they decide to do in the end is not usually the best result? Well, what happens is, is no matter what person is assigned to internal affairs, they are not the ones who ultimately give out the discipline. Well, that's true. It's or, always the chief, isn't it? Almost always. Exactly. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go up, go up the chain. And based on, like I said, that officer standing, you know, a chief of police job can be either the easiest job in the world or the hardest job in the world. And that all depends on that particular chief of police. Because if you look at our jobs, you can think back to our first days uh, on the street after getting out of the academy. It's the day that I blew a hole in the uh, shooting range. Remember that, the very first day? I shot up the range downstairs with the Sergeant Lawton. That was a little embarrassing. thought I was fired that day, but, <laughs> but I digress. Go ahead. <laughs> that... That was you? That was me. <laughs> yeah, that's why we had to close the range, remember? What a mess. Wow, we actually closed the range because of that. That's right. <laughs> uh, the um, With internal affairs, when these administrators are, for instance, given the final package, um, they have, at that point, the toughest job. Because let's say, for instance, this is, if it's a smaller department like some of the ones we worked on, the relationships are very close in those smaller agencies. And it's very difficult for a uh, chief of police to turn around and fire somebody. Maybe he came up uh, on the department. With oh, him. sure. Maybe started yeah. around, the, around the same time. It's all about relationships. In the and, police then, and ending up having to terminate them. And what, they f what we find out and what some of these chiefs find out about themselves is that they simply can't do it. They cannot bring themselves to do that. Because if you look at, uh, like I said, our first days on the job, we didn't have a problem responding to calls. You know, if anything, our supervisors had a problem with us trying to get there too fast, right. driving too fast. Um, if you go back, to, for instance, to 9-11, it is natural for the firefighters and police officers to have run into those buildings. Same it is for us to go to these calls and want to get there as quickly as possible. The bravery that we have is actually innate. It's not something that we automatic we have to suddenly summon. I mean, you right. and I, when you and I worked together on the street, we never had to summon courage. No, you just did it. You, it, you just went. Right. And so, we, actually, we get an awful lot of credit for being brave when you consider it's something that's innate. Now, when you transfer that out, going up the chain of command, and now you're sitting chief of police, um. The real bravery is in your decision making. Because, Doing what's right. Right. The yeah. chief is sitting behind the desk and they have something here. They know that this officer uh, has done wrong, but he's friends or he's 
got too many friends and you don't want to alienate because, you know, departments are very cliquish. There are various little cliques within the department, from the SWAT team to uh, the dope guys to the gang guys, and um, they can even be broken up by race and also by um, ideology or, uh, or even religion. And where bravery comes in for a chief of police is looking at an officer, let's say, who uh, did do whistleblowing and the compulsion to want to retaliate against that person. If you can fight that off, if you can fight off all the political ramifications of doing the right thing, now you're a chief of police who has got the hardest job in the world because it's innate to want to help your friends. It's That's innate right. to yeah. want to do these other things. That's not innate to just have to do the right thing all the time. That is a challenge. And some people are up to that challenge. And unfortunately, most are not. And take, for example, I can remember conversations my dad had with other administrators. And a lot of the time at that rank, they're talking about other employees. And I remember vividly them talking about, you know, what employee made them angry, how they got even with them, how they got away with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And who was next. That's right. Yeah. Cops are a bunch of... And they've of, got uh, a law firm. There's a notorious law firm um, here in Southern California called Jones and Mayer, who police chiefs hire to go after certain officers. And, for instance, let's say there's a uh, staff meeting. Um, I don't want to paint a picture of this, you know, conspiracy thing where all these administrators get together and say, oh, we're going to get this guy and so forth. That's far, far more subtle. Than that uh, what will generally happen is for instance when um, at a staff meeting where chief captains lieutenants let's say for instance are sitting around and they're talking about uh, well how's officer so-and-so doing how's this officer doing how's this officer who's in training and so forth and they'll round table these conversations they'll round table information for instance for requests for special assignments and so forth so what will happen is person's name will come up and when that person's name comes up the chief won't say anything direct they'll say something to the effect of you know i don't know if uh officer john doe fits into the long-term plans of our department and basically that's just code for i don't like this person i don't want him promoted i don't want anything to do with this individual well, now in the staff meeting, half the staff are rolling their eyes, thinking, oh, boy, here we go. And then the other half are salivating it. Okay, who can be the first police administrator to catch this guy doing wrong yeah. no, and it's please true. the chief? This stuff happens. It does happen. And, I, and I, I have internal mis- memos that show it happens. <laughs> that's, the, that's the misnomer the public has. They think that we're just a big group of people who love getting along. So here is a solution. Why don't they do this? Why don't we have... Um, like authority to have IA be the final decision. I guess you can't take politics out of everything, but uh, for example, at Disney, we had the uh, management audit department and a guy named Matt would call me up once in a while and say, Hey, I'm doing an investigation on management. We have some problems here. I want you to look at this and I do an investigation for him. And then he decided here's what happened. And he was kind of separate. He, he decided, you know, if somebody did something wrong, what they were going to do on that. And it was removed from, you know, the C-level employees because the C-level employees are like the chiefs, right? Who have their alliances and their buddies and things like this. And this was a department that, that kept, you know, kept Disney clean internally, you know, for things like that. Not dissimilar to what we're talking about, really. And uh, I always felt that anything he did was, was fair. And, he, you know, he or any person in that position could do something that wasn't fair, but there was a mechanism to redress that. But it seems like it seems counterintuitive to say, okay, I'm an IA guy. I'm already hated by my fellow police officers because I'm in internal affairs. We're <laughs> usually right. You know, I, I never bothered me because I wasn't doing anything bad, so I wasn't worried about it. But then you take that decision they make and you give it to the chief, and he can change your decision. And I don't know. It seems like it be it should be some sort of um, I don't know, if a vote's the right way, or maybe you should give it to some outside party to review it. I don't know. I, there's got to be a better way to do it because the politics. When he gets to that level and the chief has to decide, well, I know these guys just shot up a bar in West Hollywood, but, you know, I went to the academy with these guys, so I just got to give them a couple of days off, right? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't, and they're, um, you know, first of all, these chiefs of police, especially Cal chiefs, which is the chief of police union in the state of California, all they will fight tooth and nail to ever, ever relinquish that kind of power. 
because you got to remember, I mean, you've seen where they've, you know, police departments have uh, spent thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions in investigations. Um, they've spent, for instance, uh, you know, sometimes that kind of money on employees that have been injured and yet the department fights them like crazy. Oh, I see that all the time. That's very strange you know, to me too. You know, when, when they're injured, people think, well, you know, God, if you're an officer and you're injured on duty, they cover you, right? <laughs> Wrong. Oh, very seldom. It is, it, yeah. is, it is a major, major fight. And uh, people got to remember too, if an officer or somebody is shot and can no longer work, they get 50% of their salary. Well, in theory, unless they fight it, Right. Unless the, unless the department fights the thing. Usually when you're shot, that doesn't happen. But other injuries, uh, I see departments fight those things all the time. Right. Well, how do, well, we, know, how do we know you're injured? Uh, well, because you took me to the hospital in an ambulance in a police uniform, and I couldn't walk. So isn't that an indication that that was injury on duty, you know? Right. Uh, so chiefs nowadays, I don't know of many that are civil servant. Am I wrong about that? Most of them are not civil, not civil servant. There, there may be a few that exist out there, but most of them serve at the pleasure of the council. Okay, so let's talk about, for our listeners that don't understand that, used to be that if you're a police officer and you're inside the police department and you take these tests, those are civil servant tests, and you know Ray gets a 100 and I get a 99, Ray gets promoted. In theory, that's what's supposed to happen, right? Right. And the chief of police is a similar thing. It's a you know maybe internal promotion. You take a test or you're appointed by the, the city government but you're still a civil servant, which means there's certain policies and, and guidelines and laws they have to follow to write you up, discipline you, fire you. It's just not an automatic. Daryl Gates, I think, was the last civil servant chief at LAPD, and that's why they hated him so much because they couldn't fire him they had, unless there was cause. And that was interesting because that's where you had him and Mayor Tom Bradley um, who would constantly call each other names. And, of course, you couldn't. he had no power to fire the chief. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, I, I know people are going to argue that you can't have that much power with the police department. Everything's a balance. So Daryl Gates had a tremendous amount of power as the chief, as the mayor has a tremendous amount of power as the mayor. And those two balance each other out. You see what I'm saying? Because it's equal in a way. But if you give all the power of the police department to the civilian body, I mean, really, who's going to, who's going to police the civilian body? Who's going to, are you going to walk up and arrest the mayor for doing cocaine? Uh, no, because he'll fire you. Correct. I mean, that's a fact. I don't care what anybody says. Oh, no, uh, there's mechanisms to get around that. That's a bunch of baloney. It's not going to happen. If you think your job's on the line, you're not going to act the same as if your job was not as much on the line. In other words, if, if you thought your job's protected through fair process and due process of law, you take your chances on your behavior, right? Right. But when you think your job you know, is on pins and needles all the time, and this is for any job, by the way, this isn't just police, you are not behaving in your true self. And I don't care what anybody says. They're, they're just lying about that. And, and this notion that police unions are there to support their officers. Um, Not you know, necessarily. I was, I, I, was I started one. I was president of the San Gabriel Police Officers Association for two years, vice president two years, secretary for one year before that. And I can tell you, even during that process, um, for instance, I was the uh, Los Angeles chapter secretary for PORAC which is the Peace Officers Research Association in Oh, that's California. right. I remember that, yeah. And that is a statewide uh, union. And that's where that's a union that basically all the smaller unions belong to. And they have, for instance, the Legal Defense Fund, which funds our uh, legal defense and internal affairs investigations. And over the years, I've seen the very organization I used to work for, PORAC, uh, become hijacked by administrators because now you've got presidents of PORAC that are lieutenants and that was absolutely unheard well, that's of yeah that is unheard of um to where you would have administrators actually administrating right. the union and so now that has grown into political things too to where the union actually is when they select uh the type of defense you get you could end up with an antiquated defense in your internal affairs investigation just because you're not liked any more than the administration hold that thought we're gonna take a quick break and be back in a minute on security guy radio that's security guy radio.com security guy radio for your mobile application that you guys are gonna love so check it out bye hi everyone this is chuck from security guy radio when you watch us on youtube you've seen our really cool in-studio banner and probably pondered where did Chuck get that groovy sign? Well, from Signorama, of course. Are you planning a corporate event? 
family picnic, garage sale, or starting up a new business, Cynorama of Van Nuys has hundreds of ways to promote. All done with a little microphone here in Whittier, California. So we're talking with uh, Ray Schneider's, uh, formerly San Gabriel Fontana PD, an old police buddy of mine from the academy back in uh, class 61. Hoorah! Hoorah! Back in 1982 we started. And we're just kind of talking about police stuff and things you guys might not know about how police departments really work inside internally and, um, you know, why while the majority of 99.9% of all the cops are good guys and great guys and, and uh, you know, outstanding citizens, really, um, the, the people that run the police department sometimes, not so much, and uh, causes a lot of problems. Um, so we were talking about internal affairs at the break. I'm sorry, unionizing. And uh, here's, here's a good point. So back in the day, I started the union at, at uh, the UC campuses. That's the University of California. They have their own police department. And they're full police officers. I think there was nine campuses back then. I had to go around. I had to organize every single campus and had to get every uh, police officer signed up. 300-something had to sign up personally. This is all because of National Labor Relations Board rules and things like that. And uh, I was the president, and then we had – you helped me out here. What, you know, secretary, sergeant at arms, right, all this. Right, you'll have vice president, yeah, all secretary, that stuff. treasurer, yeah. sergeant at arms. And we organized as one – uh, union and by the way we're not legally a union union per se because we can't strike and do certain things as a police officer but more for practical purposes it's a union right right more, more along the lines of collective bargaining uh, or they call it a police association you know that's another way they say it right right so you know this was a big deal to get that organized it just had never been done and nobody thought it could be done but we you know we did it and um then they came after me because i got hurt and you know started papering me you know the whole, same kind of thing sure so we had a meeting that was supposed to take place, and um, a union meeting or association meeting. And uh, I think I just started working for Fox, and I couldn't make it. And uh, next thing I know, some other guy's the president, some other guy's the secretary. It was a total hijack by another campus took over the, the, the POA. And I said, well, you can't because the rules we wrote here that everybody signed says you got to have a quorum. There's to be so many officers present. There wasn't enough officers. Went, well, we don't care, blah, blah, blah. So fast forward, you know, I don't know, 20 years now or something. And I was just talking to some other guy at one of the UC campuses. And now all those campuses have their own individual presidents and their own individual secretaries and own individual representation, which is what we voted against in the first place. So naturally now nothing gets done. Uh, nobody votes on anything because nobody can agree because Berkeley wants more money than UCLA and so on, which is what it was when we started. But who did that? Well, they changed the rules to allow sergeants as part of the collective bargaining unit. I think they may have allowed lieutenants or something like that. Which is ludicrous because they're the people that are trying to not give you what you want in the first place. It's insanity, right? That's one of the things you mentioned, sergeants. That's one of those things with uh, management and uh, rank and file. You know, some people consider sergeants management. Some consider them rank and file. Right. They consider, they're managers. Everybody they consider officers or lieutenant and above. Like for instance, in the military, all officers are the rank of lieutenant or above. So sometimes we have the that that same picture if you're yeah if i can got, see that if you've got stripes you're rank and file but let's put it this way uh if you're above me administratively you're an administrator it's just kind of the way it works if you can pay for me and say don't do something if you can give me a command to not do something or to do it then you're my boss correct and you shouldn't That's be in, you shouldn't be in the in the guard collective bargaining unit i mean guard the police officer collective bargaining unit. you just shouldn't be i don't know and and, and sergeants are a little closer to the line guys and than not but that's part of the problem they just create those situations to erode the power of the of the unit right so when you know when police officers get in these positions and now they have no voice and no authority and things aren't right the work conditions aren't good and you blow the whistle on that then the people come after you and say well what are you doing we don't want you to air that dirty laundry and you know it's 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 a problem and I, and I think this stuff goes on a lot more than people know any cop listening to this right now knows this stuff goes on no they do and with um for instance if you look now a, a good indicator um, about uh, how well you did as a police union president is whether you ever got promoted after holding that position or not. <laughs> if you didn't get promoted. If you didn't get promoted, well, then you were I, probably the best president that union ever had. Well, I and, got fired, so I must be even better. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and, and they do. I mean, you know, San Gabriel tried that too and failed miserably. I remember. I remember failed miserably yeah. trying to do it. Um, but, yeah, that's that's – that's their only uh, recourse in their mind. And because one, it's, um, they don't like being challenged. Uh, oftentimes they're incredibly insecure. 
And a lot of times, once they have this power, it's all about holding on to that power. And anything that challenges it is immediately identified as a threat to that power. Um, because as you'll notice, especially with administrators and whether this is, you know, the city manager, which is an individual that the chief of police often is the person they have to answer to. Uh, you'll come to find out that what they do has nothing to do with what's right or wrong. It even has nothing to do about money. It's all about power. No, it's and, not money because their budgets are set, and that's you don't get rewarded by spending less of your budget. It, you, right. It's all, it's all about power and right. the manic egos of those that possess and abuse it. Well, it's interesting because there used to be a cartoon. I think it was called uh, We the People and the the tagline was, uh, what if the president of the United States was a civil servant position, right? And, and and they acted that way, right? Right. And it was an interesting cartoon because if it was, it would be completely different. And police chiefs, um, and I've interviewed several of them, and I, I think they're great people. They're very smart people, by the way. I, anyone, I've interviewed four of them so far, and I know others. Uh, if you think about the power aspect... Instead of looking at it from perspective of responsibility, right? So I've been in leadership roles as a vice president or, you know, oldest of 14 kids or whatever it is. And I've always looked at my position as a, a responsibility position, not a power position. I mean, I can make decisions, but it's my responsibility to make them responsibly, my responsibility to my people that follow me to do things that are proper. Even on the show, I, gotta, I, I can't just say anything I want. I'm not saying I'm going to edit myself, but I, you know, it, it's in a semi-leadership where people are following you. You have to speak a language that everybody can hear. And that language is not do as I say, not as I do. You can't, you can't say those kind of things. <laughs> it doesn't work, right? And so a lot of times administrators and police departments, I think they want to be the chief. And so that I don't see this in the chief so much. Any chief I've ever known gets that part of it because of the politics and fairness. And But as you go up, all those people below the chief, they want to be chief. And they think to get there, they got to wipe out the people blow them sometimes, right? Does right. Make sense. They have they have to be willing to show loyalty to the king, right? And that's by going after people that he doesn't like. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times I think they just go after people because they think the chief doesn't like or something. But I, I I'm not even sure they even ask the chief because that's the real internal small view of, of politics and police departments is there's these little fiefdoms going on where you know that guy thinks he knows what's what's happened that. Let's say that supervisor thinks he knows what the chief likes or doesn't like and uh, acts independently a lot of times and inappropriately because they go after cops and they stress, stress their lives out. I, I've always told people when they ask me, oh, that's a tough job. No, I think police work is the absolute easiest job in the world. Am it's, I wrong? It's the most fun it's I've how, ever had in my life. It's unbelievable. It's a fun job. Why is it easy? It's easy because what? You get to get in a car turn on some lights, run a siren, play with dogs and motorcycles and chase people and jump over fences and say, stop it. It's a blast, right? That's not stressful. We're all trained for that. You're psychologically screened for that. You're a type of person that likes to do that kind of thing. The not part fun is the stuff we're talking about. The politics, the pettiness, the uh, disloyalty, uh, really, of officer to officer. When I say that, I'm not saying that you're disloyal because you blow the whistle. I'm saying you're disloyal because you're writing up some paper on somebody that's completely a bunch of nonsense and baloney just so you can get promoted. And that goes on all the time. And believe me, I was written up enough to know, although I don't think anybody ever successfully hung paper on me. They never did because I could just say, well, by well, the way, you said you dated that paper August 28th, but actually that event happened on uh, May 30th. So. But see, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that they were well, it doesn't matter successful to them. No. because their, their tactic is to make you as miserable as no. humanly possible. Yeah. They want you to be miserable. They want others to see you miserable. If they can ultimately fire you with or without cause, uh, you know, they'll do so too. No, I've seen this. I have seen where, um, and I, ha I have a personal experience with this. I worked at one department and I left to another department. And then some people from that department wanted to come with me to another department. And the originating police department would not let that guy go even though they hated him, even though they tried to fire him, even though they tried to get rid of him a dozen times, they wouldn't just say to the, the new chief, should we hire this guy? You think they just want to get him? No, they wanted to keep him there under their thumb with the, with the threat of termination all the time. Right. It's just petty stuff. I, I don't get this stuff. Well, it, it's like I said, it's, it's all about power. It's all about control. And that's why, well, keep those same people we 
nameless people. You know who I'm talking about. It's ridiculous. Absolutely. They would carry secondary personnel files. And so when a background investigator would come out to your department that you're working at, who's who's from a department you've now applied with, uh, they'll come out and they'll see the personnel file that you're familiar with. And they'll say, you know, officer so-and-so has been a, you know, okay officer, but he's had some problems. And then what you have there are a bunch of undocumented, uh, uns basically solicited complaints or comments, things that would make the officer look bad. But they legally cannot put them in that officer's personal file. I saw that. But they'll show it to the background investigator and try to scare them off and say, nah, you don't want to hire this guy. This I've seen that happen. No problems. I've seen that happen personally. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Right in front of me, they pulled out this other file. And by the way, if I say it's against the law, I'm not sure that's not too strong. But I mean, it's it's not. I think it is part of the, the labor code that you can't do those kind of things. And police departments have a whole, police officers have a whole separate section that protects them and protects their personnel files and things by law. Right, and you, you have the right to see what's in your personnel file. That's right. And anything that is negative, you have a right to see. And Comment on actually, it. it should be signed. Should be signed, that's right. A lot of times, that's why they keep this other file of these other non-specific complaints and innuendos and things. And and again, I don't get why the, the, uh, the supervisor doing that thinks that helps their department. If the guy's such a, a jerk and you hate him, what do you... What are you doing that for? What are you trying to get them not employed for? I guess because they think they're going to keep them employed and fire them eventually or something. Well, actually, when it, when you get into that mindset, their thought is, is if this officer is able to apply with another department and go on and have a successful career at another agency he likes better, then he wins. And their egos just simply cannot tolerate that. That's why they will spend an inordinate amount of money to either try to fire them because uh, they'll spend hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars in attorney's fees, outside attorney's fees, to try to terminate somebody, whether if they just left them alone or let them go to another department, it wouldn't cost anything. No, I, they don't mind spending that it's money. It's true. Uh, uh, I've seen that too. It's it's amazing phenomenon. Um, here's what I think. Think about all the police officers you've worked with, and I've worked with hundreds, hundreds, maybe a thousand, maybe. You know, probably yourself too with the rest and things. And I made about a thousand arrests. You probably made three times that many. And I think if I ever met a police officer that wasn't um, an alpha male or alpha female, have you met one? I don't think so. No. Now, I, I have met them, but they really tend not to last in the job or, or, okay. or are so miserable they end up getting out. If they're, That's true for that group of people. But then the people that are in, there are people at the bottom of the alpha scale that are still alpha to your next door neighbor, right? Correct. And the guy at the top is, you know, over the top, crazy, dominant, whatever you want to call it, right? But there's still people that are in charge of things. They they have a natural leadership ability. They have a natural take charge ability. They don't, like I said, they run into the burning building. They don't run away from the burning building. And they just think, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. So when you put all those sort of personalities in one place and think, we're all just going to get along, it's not going to happen because, no. I, I mean, I, I when I was a, a rookie, um, in San Gabriel, my buddy, uh, my now buddy for 32 years, Mikey, uh, we went on a call and I was, I was on my own for just, you know, a couple of weeks as a, a, an L car, single car. And he jumped a call and, uh, Sergeant Lawton got all, you know, like, uh, teed off and showed up and said, what are you jumping the call for? You write the paper. Well, Mike had to write the paper and it was a big wazoo cluster and he didn't want to write the paper on it. So he comes back in the, in the police station, then to watch the gas of the car and he gets out of the car and this guy, I mean, his arms are bigger than my legs too. This guy's, he's a big guy, a bodybuilder, you know, very macho sort of guy, not like 150 Just pounds. Just a little. Runt, you know. <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, what the bleep are you doing? Jumping my bleep and call and bleep, 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 bleep. Starts yelling and screaming and getting all puffed up and big. And, you know, he, I'm a rookie. So he thinks, what? I'm going to say, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Let me shine your boots. And I said, you know, this is for you and this is for your horoscope yourself. You jump my call and I don't give a crap. Oh my God, did he get mad about that? Because now you got a rookie telling them to go buzz off, which you don't do and last very long in your career. But again, I'm not a policeman because I'm a wallflower. Right. Right. And so even a rookie stands up. So you put these sort of personalities together and I think that's what causes it. It's hard to step out and say to my, as my fellow officer, you know, you're challenging me. You're challenging me by accusing me of something. And guess what? I'm not going to put up with it. So I'm going to fight you on that. 
and then you're going to turn around, you're going to fight me harder to try and paper me because you think you're right about it. And it's just this personality clash that I think causes it. I don't think you would see that in many other professions. I mean, at the studios, if they wrote you up, it's because they don't want to get sued. And by the way, when they fire you, they don't want to get sued. So they're going to do both things to not get sued, to do a proper investigation for the most part, make sure it's tight as it can be, and try not to get you suing them for being for firing you or somebody else. They don't care about that, the police department. They don't no. care if they get sued because they're immune from personal liability usually in those things. And they just say, uh, I'm going to show you. So I think part of it is this kind of this alpha male, female personality that's all in one room and... <laughs> right and yeah those so what's right is there You're any gonna, other possible outcome than that i don't right. think there is there's going to be conflict but right is still right oh, i no agree matter with that. if they're alphas or not and 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 good people that understand you know the use of leadership and how, how it works properly they're, they're not going to buy into that kind of stuff and things right but well, on the other hand people that are police officers have this really really fine-tuned oversensitive sense of um, fairness and right and wrong. And you can think, oh, no, because the policemen enforce the laws. It's not. No, you, you, you don't gravitate toward police work unless you really believe in right and wrong and good and bad and fair and unfair, right? And see those things. And so when a police officer tries to uh, paper another police officer with some bogus internal affairs thing, just for no other reason than to, you know, F with you and all that kind of stuff, the, the person being attacked is going to not respond very nicely because they, too, are a strong personality that – isn't going to put up with it. And people view us as being insensitive when the truth is, is we're probably a little on the hypersensitive side. Oh, absolutely. Where we can have our feelings hurt just like anybody else. Yeah. And when feelings get hurt, of course, you know, in law enforcement culture, you don't say you hurt my feelings. Those, that's right. not the language, not even in the gang culture. They say you dissed me. Right. Well, the truth is, is that you hurt me, but you can't get alpha males or anyone else to admit, well, you hurt my feelings. Well, I think what you could do, and the way I would phrase that is you've, you've challenged my dignity and you've challenged my integrity. Sure. And which I, also hurts your feelings. Well, it does hurt your feelings. And, and I know you have a, you carry extra handkerchiefs with you, but I, I'm not so opposed to that, <laughs> predisposed <laughs> to that thing. But I, I totally get get it what you're saying. Um, you are challenging the integrity of people who swore an oath, who promised to protect people that believe in that stuff. I don't know of anybody that ever stood next to me and swore an oath that said, uh, you know, I kind of mostly believe what that said, only part of it. It's just a whole culture that you have to buy into and want to do that and do right for, and do good by people. And so now you're telling me that I've broken my oath to the people that I protect. You're saying that I did something that's against my integrity. And, and integrity, you know, is your internal code, right? And I don't know a cop that didn't screw up when he really screwed up and he knew he screwed up that didn't say he screwed up. I've never met one. Have you? A couple. Okay, but not many. A couple. And I mean, but not many. again, these are people that right. would go down to the corner and argue with a stop sign. Right. They're never going to be wrong. But so... Yeah. But but when you go after somebody that's absolutely for no other reason than political reasons, and you're challenging somebody that has high integrity and high values to begin with, because that's what your profession you're in, you're gonna you're gonna start a bonfire. You better you better have something to put it out because people aren't gonna put up with that. Well, and that's what's confusing too, because when you get into this profession for all the right reasons, and you are suddenly being uh, ostracized for simply doing what was you know supposed to be the right thing. Um, it, it, it's really confusing because you're thinking, wait a minute, I, you know, this isn't supposed to be happening to me. Actually, the opposite is the supposed opposite, to be right. happening. That's supposed to be my reward for playing by the rules. Right. For instance, when you, I'm, you've talked, I know you've talked to a lot of chiefs of police and interviewed them. And uh, one of the things that confuses everyone in law enforcement is when they will say something like, you know, what's your number one priority? Well, that's officer safety. That is my number one priority. Well, it's simply not true because all you'd have to do is ask that chief of police. Okay, so every police car you put out on the street is a two-officer unit? And they're going to go, well, uh, uh, no. Well, <laughs> well, not every call oh, no, needs on. two I'm officers. Gonna, and... I'm going to call you on that. I, I'm not going to say that it's not true just because they didn't put out two-man units because they're, they are uh, restricted by what? Budgets, well, money. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but what, scheduling, manpower. I mean, there is we still, talk about it on the show a lot lately that, for example, a place like San Jose PD has half as many cops as they did when you and I were rookies. Right. Half. Has crime gone down in half? Stockton. No, exactly. So I, I'm i going to back the Chiefs on that and say, that if they say officer safety is their 
priority. I'm going to believe them, but I'm also going to believe that they're maybe restricted by budgets and things, you know. Well, they're not restricted. If you, if we're in charge of scheduling, let's say for, for instance, in here in Whittier, if we just put everybody in two officer units that day, the only thing your budget is going to reflect is the fact that your response times are not going to be what they were. They will be longer. They will be right. longer. Right. But it will, in fact, be safer for the officers. Well, that's true. That's true. All right. But then then your crime's going to go up because you don't have uh, as much as a physical presence out there on the street. Well, there's no cop cars around. We're going to do something. You know that's true. Sure. If we put out... 100 single-man units in uh, Culver City or San Gabriel. Let's use San Gabriel because we know how big that is. If there's 100 black and whites out there, would there be any crime in San Gabriel? There would be none. There'd be none. There'd be absolutely zero crime, right? Because right. there's a direct correlation between high visibility and deterrent factor. People, that's for sure. So if you put out three two-man units and it's more effective in its officer safety, that's true. But then again, if you had 100 one-man units, there is no officer safety problem because there's so many of them, there's no crime. And why there's so many of them that they could be literally driving in tandem around the city, you know. So right. I see what you're saying. It's, it's, yeah. So when they say that, it, I'm, no doubt that it is a priority. Officer safety is a priority right. for a chief of police. But when when I hear him say it's my absolute number one priority, well, we can cite that. We can cite equipment. We can cite a lot of different things that would say, well, okay, it's a priority. But let's say it's not your number one priority. You know, it could be three or four. Response times are the main goal they're trying to you know do more with less which yeah, is they all are. which it's, it's is under how much less it is which is what you know law enforcement uh you know has to contend we got about two minutes left so how do we fix it what do we do i don't see it getting fixed i well you're here to give us a solution you're the expert you got to tell us but this, what can we do <laughs> i think we should go back to police chief police chiefs of police being civil servant protected so they have the ability to act properly without fear of being politically well, right, killed. Because they can be voted out. If you've got, for instance, a five-member council, city council, uh, a lot of times it's just a majority. But some city managers who also serve at the pleasure of the council will have something written into their contract where it will take at least a 4-1 vote to have you removed. Right. Uh, with chiefs of police, generally they're contract employees. So when uh, their term is up, they don't late. necessarily have to fire them. They just don't renew their yeah, contract. I just think that's wrong. And they get somebody else. I think you get a different sort of person in there. You get a different sort of leadership. I, right. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's effective. I because think, actually your chief of police is going to, you're going to find, is spending more time with the city manager, the city council, and political heads, you know, throughout right. the city than they are with their own. Same thing in security. Everybody wants to be in charge of your security department. Why? I have no idea why everybody always wanted my job. You can have it. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> Oh, look, we're out of time. Well, Ray, thanks for out coming in, buddy. Fastest hour in the world here. It goes by quickly, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, we could keep talking. You want to come back? Absolutely. All right. Very good. We'll continue the discussion later. Mr. Brian, did you learn something today? Well, we can't hear you nodding your head on the radio. I learned that I would never be a police officer. I'm too soft. <laughs> I am not alpha male.